our Weston Power Plant. Uh, the one to the east in Green Bay, uh, we actually have closed the original box that was on the Pulliam Power Plant and then um, reopened a box at the downtown um, WPS headquarter office. Uh, as you move further south, there's the one in Port Washington, as, as most of you are probably very aware. And then we've got our Valley Power Plant in downtown Milwaukee and a bit further south in Oak Creek. Uh, here's a shot of the Oak Creek Power Plant. Um, there are actually two power plants there. We've got Oak Creek Power Plants more in the foreground right, and then the one in the back, which is the newer plant, uh, our Elm Road Generating Station. The box itself used to be on a stack that is no longer there, um, and it was some 300 some you know feet above <clears throat> above ground. It now sits in this new structure, which is an air quality uh, system um, um, structure here. The box is is really kind of neat in that it's built directly into the wall of the structure. Um, it gives us complete access from the inside on an elevator that takes us near to the top of the structure. Um, in this instance and in a couple of others, we have absolutely zero contact or potential for contact, which is always a concern for worker safety uh, with really adults that may be uh, attempting to protect the box. About our Valley Power Plant, uh, this one we also moved, uh, I wanna say it was about four or five years ago from up on top of the stack here on uh, the sidewall, there was some new equipment that was added down uh, near the surface that uh, when it runs, it causes some vibration. That vibration was actually being felt up in the, up in the original box. Um, once we realized that, and it, it kind of came to pass because we were having some trouble uh, getting the adults to kind of to, to kind of stick to the box and actually nest there. So we, um, uh oh, I've got something goofy going on. <laughs> Those red lines are showing up. Hopefully that stops. I don't think it's me, but um, we'll see what happens here. Um, so we moved the box to the top of the rooftop. Uh, what what is interesting for this site is it is a I'm I'm taking this picture from Google Street View. So from the street itself, you can see the box uh, from a public access standpoint. Yeah, I apologize, those red lines, I'm not sure where those came from, but uh, I guess we'll have to bear with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, Mike, Washington, either. Washington uh, so. sites, pardon me? Uh, I just, I'm not sure where those came from either, Mike, so um, I'll keep looking to see if we can change, do something. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so the Port Washington site, uh, this one is a very accessible site. And I know some of you, uh, Kim, in fact, I know spends uh, a lot of time actually watching from this public parking lot, which is the South Beach Access location. And uh, it, it's our most accessible box. If, if you've ever wanted to or do have interest in viewing Peregrine Falcons, really pretty up close and personal. Uh, this Port Washington site is, is, I think, one of your best opportunities to do that. The Weston Power Plant, uh, so this is the WPS site up kind of in the central part of the state. This box is actually set um, on the back side of the building. This is, again, the street view perspective. Uh, the box kind of faces the river um, where the, the Falcons uh, largely perch from and hang out and, and do, their, uh, do their hunting from that area. The WPS site, um, for those that venture up to Green Bay, so there's a perspective in the top right. This is actually our Falcon Cam. I took a screenshot this morning to update that. Um, you can see down below there's a trail along the river walk there. Um, we, we installed this box here about, well, it's been two seasons now, and that was in conjunction of the closure of the, the Pulliam Power Plant uh, nest box. Um, very visible, uh, very accessible for public viewing. Uh, unfortunately, we have not yet had an adult pair um, utilize the box. What we have seen is directly across the river, if you look in the screenshot uh, to the top right, there's um, a, a building there, and we literally, from our camera in the nest box itself, we can literally see nesting 
um, coming in and out of the nest anyway, across the river in a, in a uh, basically an open rooftop along um, some grain elevator uh, structures. We're hoping that the falcons understand that our nest box that we've installed is actually a more hospitable environment for them to nest, and that they take to that nest box in, uh, oh, there go the lines. Thank you, whoever was able to get rid of them. Um, so anyway, those are the five current nest sites that are open that we, that we own and, and still uh, manage. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, real briefly about the other uh, three or four here. Milwaukee County, County Power Plant, so this is on um, uh, Watertown Plank Road directly across from the, the Regional Medical Complex and, and Children's Hospital. Um, it's another very accessible, at least from a viewing standpoint, from the sidewalk along Watertown Plank. The challenge there is finding uh, safe parking and making sure that if you do try to venture there um, that you're you're safe along one of the, the busiest roads I think in Milwaukee County. Um, that site we sold in 2016 to the to the regional medical facility and uh, no longer operate that but the box is still in operation and, and as I understand it there is a, a successful uh, nesting occurring this year. Pleasant Prairie, um, this gives you kind of an inside view of what I described for the Oak Creek plant, where the nest box itself is situated and built directly into the structure. Um, what it does is it allows us from the inside basically just to hatch, uh, uh, a door hatch there that, that we can open up and access the box to do the maintenance and uh, the banding and so forth. But there's really only one or, well, really two times during the year that there's any potential interaction with the falcons in that circumstance. Presque Isle up in Marquette, Michigan. Uh, this one was up on, on the stack. It was an exposed structure or nest structure that you can see in the top right there. Uh, that box we uh, closed in 2018 in anticipation for uh, the decommissioning of that project and, and removal of the, the project. Pulliam I mentioned earlier, um, that arrow actually somehow slid over on me, but the arrow should be pointing to the rooftop to the left. Um, this is a uh, shot, actually a, a street view shot from um, the large bridge that goes over the Fox River where it comes into the mouth of Green Bay. Um, so before I go on, the the last three that I mentioned, Presque Isle, uh, Polium, and um, Pleasant Prairie, so those three sites um, what we did not want to do is close those boxes and not have, not afford an opportunity to the Falcons to find another nesting location. So in um, in each of the cases we worked with partners and it happened to be uh, that the Pulliam Power Plant, we, we were able to work with basically ourselves and find a new location at our office building. But up in Marquette, Michigan, we worked with local partners including the Michigan DNR and uh, some local community folks. And ultimately, the Michigan DNR uh, stepped forward and, and took over sort of siting the new location, and it is now located on top of uh, a downtown structure um, in Marquette, Michigan. And then down at Pleasant Prairie, uh, about a mile, it's a little more than a mile north of where Pleasant Prairie's nest box was, uh, there's a, a, a granary there that um, has a tall structure and they were fantastic partners to work with to move that box um, again in, in 2000, between 2018 and 19. Um, they, what was, what was really quite, kind of amazing from, a, from an ecology standpoint, the, the adult pair that we had nesting at Pleasant Prairie for a number of years, uh, that very next season ended up finding that nest box a mile and a, mile and a quarter or so to the north and they have now successfully nested there uh, two consecutive years, which is really kind of remarkable when you think about the competition for nest boxes and um, the limited uh, uh, nesting availability that that same pair took to that site and um, has basically, um, they, they never missed a beat with respect to their nesting production. So as a company, from a resource commitment standpoint, there is an awful lot that goes into um, this program, it's it's a lot of of um, effort, but I would say minimal minimal time. In that we've got it to to a point where it's such a well-oiled machine that 
Um, the, the vast majority of the work is really um, done a couple of times of the year, and that's that's in the spring for the nesting season and, and doing the banding, and then in the fall, uh, the nest boxes get cleaned uh, and prepared for the following season. Um, program management, community outreach, uh, our community relations, media relations folks do a tremendous job with um, really connecting with the communities in a lot of different ways, and I'll show some examples here shortly. Um, it's it's really uh, it, it's what kind of brings a smile. It's one of the few things that that um, is is a strong driver for me to to really love and enjoy my job is seeing how much public benefit there is to essentially broadcasting um, the the nest sites and uh, seeing firsthand and hearing firsthand some accounts of people that have been touched by or participate in watching and you know I've, I've had contacts certainly locally but as far as uh, down in the, the southeast in Georgia um, South Carolina area up the East Coast from a number of different locations I've even had contacts from uh, from folks in Great Britain and um, it's uh, it's really quite remarkable how far this program has has reached um, obviously, we've got the sites and, and the nest box materials and construction, um, but we could not do any or very minimal any way of outreach with all of this if we did not have these high-def um, point uh, tilt-zoom cameras. And, and for those who have never seen one of these or have always wondered, well, what kind of camera, what does this thing look like, in the top right of this image is the camera itself that we currently have installed at all of our sites. Uh, it's got a, it's kind of a weather protected type thing, even though it's in the sheltered box uh, with the dome and all of that. But um, it's, it, that's what it is. It's kind of a, a bulky um, contraption for the camera that sits in the dome uh, down below. And then, of course, our streaming infrastructure and signage. I always kind of like the, uh, the, some of the signs that we have at some of our sites. And you'll see that, you know, take proper precautions, wear hard hats, face shields, gloves, coats, brooms, and have a second person. This does not go, even for myself, this does not go unnoticed um, because when <clears throat> some of the sites, like in, in particular on Valley, right now we have perhaps one of, if not the most aggressive female that we've ever had at any of our sites. Um, it is uh, a circumstance where if you do not have at least one extra, if not multiple extra people with brooms, and at many of our facilities where we have exposure like that, we have brooms sitting right outside the door for ourselves and, and certainly the workers that may have to go onto the rooftops for inspections or other type of work they may be doing. Um, they, uh, you, you do need PP for, for your own protection, but also the Falcon's uh, protection as well. And it's something I really take to heart because if we do have or ever would have an incident where somebody was injured as a result of this, I'm afraid that we would end up losing the opportunity to have this program altogether. Uh, we, we get a tremendous amount of employee, employee engagement in this uh, at each site, and these shots are all representative shots of a number of individuals who are um, sort of the, the champions at each site. Without those individuals, uh, this program could never have taken off, had taken off the way it did and sustained for as long as it has. Um, and I'll talk about Greg here in a second. Um, the uh, Falcon production at We Energies and WPS nest sites uh, really uh, started, and I should have, shoot, I should have changed that to 1996. Um, please move this window from the shared application. Not sure. I don't know if that's Jessica or um, Natalie. Do you know if that note that's popping up is somebody typing in a message? I have no idea. <laughs> Natalie. Okay. I don't know. I was able to get rid of the red lines, but I don't know where that one's coming from. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> it's it's not hopefully affecting too much here. Uh, the uh, the content of the presentation. We'll just we'll just keep rolling. Um, they should really say 1996 to 2019. Um, 1996 was the first year we had a successful nest, naturally occurring uh, um, nest uh, at our WPS polium site. And you can see polium um, 
really for the the test of 22 years had the most production of all the sites uh, followed closely by Oak Creek and um, Port Washington and Pleasant Prairie. The uh, class of 2013 for our company uh, was the high water mark with 28 young chicks um, <laughs> produced in that one year, which is is really a remarkable outcome. Where you can see there are many years where there are sometimes zeros in here or just one or two. Uh, well, that year every site except for one had at least three, and uh, Valley had two. So. Um, 2013 was was kind of our high water mark, followed closely by 2016. In total, um, the WC peregrine sites has produced 400, just over 400 young peregrine chicks um, in the the time that falcons that were were first reintroduced in the 90s. Um, this is about 20% of the total falcons produced across Wisconsin. Uh, since introdu introduction first started in the early 90s. Um, if you were to add in uh, the other power plant sites and other, we'll say, um, tall granary type sites, uh, without these tall structures, the falcon population would not, would not be recovered to the point where it is now at or possibly even above the historic um, nesting levels that, that was in Wisconsin originally. Um, so it's really a, a, a testament, whether or not I work for WC Energy Group, it, it's really a testament as to how uh, we as humans back, you know, in the D days of DDT, which is really what caused the demise of peregrines in the first place, um, how we as humans were able to alter the course of complete extirpation of peregrine falcons uh, east, of, east of the Rockies um, and, and turn that around and, and really have it now at a, at a point in time where the natural reproduction of, of peregrines is at or above original populations that were estimated prior to the EDT. Uh, a couple of unique slides here, interesting slides. They're, um, these falcons travel uh, far and wide. They've, they've been known to, um, well, the, the name itself is, is really uh, the root of it. The, the Latin root is one who wanders. Uh, so peregrines are known to travel far, far distances. Now, this slide here is is really the a shot of the natal origins of um, where peregrines have come from, and what what that means is where were they born, and where did they end up nesting with with respect to the sites that we have and have managed. Um, so this is a, a look at just the We Energy sites that uh, that Greg had um, done for me a couple of years ago, and you can see that. It's, it's kind of an upper Midwest population with respect to where they were born and where they ended up nesting. Um, you know, they've, they've come from as far as Cleveland or Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, all the way up in northern Minnesota, Lake Superior shore, uh, shoreline areas. Um, but even in the, this bottom chart is a little bit tough to, tough to see, but just locally in downtown, uh, the, the Milwaukee metro area, there are a number of falcons who are born in one location and they just move a few miles um, to find a nest site and, and end up nesting there. From an outbound standpoint, so where do the falcons go when they are hatched, you know, when they hatch and, and fledge from our nests? Um, from here you can see there's a similar distribution, um, at least for the, the sample that Greg looked at. You know, they've, they've gone from our sites in the southeast Wisconsin area to as far as uh, southeast of, of uh, Cincinnati and Indianapolis, up to Detroit, um, and then locally. Similarly, we do have uh, falcons that uh, was kind of represented in the last slide as well, where there's there's this local population that kind of sticks around from a nesting perspective. We have had records, um, observations, I guess, of falcons as far east as um, New York City. Where they where they were observed uh, there, they did not necessarily nest there, and we've also had falcons that that we've banded at our sites, uh, all the way down into the uh, the depths of the Caribbean. Um, in fact, we had one show up in uh, uh, it was I believe it was Venezuela a couple of years ago, 
and um, it was injured. It was found injured. They, uh, whoever found it was able to get it to a local um, zoo, and unfortunately the zoo there did not have kind of the, the measures uh, to, to protect the falcon as they were rehabbing it, and it ended up um, getting, getting taken out by rats, unfortunately. But the, the distances that these, these birds will travel is just tremendous. And for the most part, um, many of them, the vast majority of the population is, is uh, expected that they, they travel south for the winter like, like many migratory birds. But because of the shoreline situation we have here along Lake Michigan and some of the major rivers in Wisconsin, um, we do have a local presence really throughout the year, even, even when falcons typically would be expected to migrate. So long as there's a decent food resource and they have shelter to hang out in, uh, they will, some will stick around for, for the winter months. Um, those that do travel far, uh, we don't know where they all go exactly. We don't have transmitters on them, but they typically do start to show back up uh, sort of on our doorstep in the nest boxes in uh, late February and into March. Um, preceding nesting, and they don't waste a whole lot of time once they show back up to, to begin courting and nesting, of course, uh, towards the end of March and in April. Um, this is one of the, the greatest pleasures, I guess, of, of the program for me, and a lot of the work actually comes directly from our outreach folks and from Greg Sefton. Um, but we we get the opportunity in normal years. This year we, we've had to forego this, but we get the opportunity to go in front of uh, elementary and, and middle school uh, classes, partnering with local community schools um, to bring the message to them. Um, we do a little bit of a presentation. Oftentimes it's tied to a naming contest for their class. And then of course the class that, that wins gets to, uh, gets to name the chicks. But um, in, a, in a normal year, we will um, typically go out and visit with anywhere from two to three classrooms, maybe maybe as many as four. And from an education standpoint, an environmental education standpoint, it is it never ever ceases to amaze me how these these children, these kids, um, can can go literally sometimes for hours asking questions and hardly ever repeating a question and their questions are entirely entirely about the falcons. Um, Greg and I, we, we chuckle sometimes because we'll, we'll be in front of a class and, and all of a sudden there's 45 minutes have gone or an hour has passed, hour and 15 minutes has passed, and the, and the students are still asking questions. And in the middle of it, the teacher will say, no, no, it's okay, we'll, we'll take a break later or um, we'll get on to our next class later on. Don't worry about you know, running over time. And uh, it's just this, this fascinating and, and incredibly... Um, enriching and rewarding experience to have these kids get the opportunity to see something that very, very few would ever have the chance to in their lifetime um, and be so engaged in the conversation. Um, so that's, that's, I wanted to share that with you as far as uh, kind of the education component that comes with this. Um, media, uh, I think most of you are, are certainly well aware of the, the media attention that the Peregrine Falcons get just about every spring. We, we, do, um, we do that with intention, um, certainly to bring the message uh, out to the, the general public. Um, it is uh, kind of, I almost see it as a duty, as a responsibility that we have as environmental stewards um, to, to, share the, to share the message and, and explain when we can the, the uh, positive side of, of being able to do this kind of a recovery, raptor recovery program with the Falcons, um, even, even as a large you know, uh, utility corporation. In the center of the screen, and uh, I'll bring Greg up now, um, none of this, frankly, would have been possible and would not, would not have happened if it were not for Greg Septon. Um, Greg is... Uh, he, he really is a leader with respect to uh, environmental stewardship, and in, he is one of the most humble and genuine individuals you'd ever meet in your life, but the mark that he has made on um, the outcomes of the, the DDT era uh, is, is really unfounded, and um, I cannot speak more highly of Greg. I had uh, a real distinct honor to be with him when he banded his 1,000th uh, chick in 2017. Um, 
if you think about how many falcons may have been produced from those thousands, from that 1,000 peregrine falcons that Greg had participated in and banded himself, um, it's just it's just remarkable how much impact he has had uh, on this program. So uh, many times Greg and I will uh, will do these kinds of talks together. I ended up just deciding to do this one uh, on my own here, but uh, certainly Greg is a dear friend, and and I hope if if you ever get the opportunity to <laughs> to meet Greg or, or have conversation with Greg, he is one of the most salt of the earth individuals you ever meet, and um, really is his passion is peregrine falcons. Our webcams, of course, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the outreach. We wouldn't be able to bring the live streaming uh, to the to the desktops and kitchen tables and, and TVs if somebody's live streaming through their, their TV uh, without a webcam. So I, I mentioned the, the camera itself before. Um, for me, uh, internally within our, our sort of network system, there is a very, very small handful of people, uh, Greg and myself, of course, and then a couple of people on our, our media group, um, and then our IT. We've got one or two individuals in IT who have access to uh, the cameras and the view that I get to see um, if, if, I, if I took the time to do it on a daily basis is this view here and I can reposition the cameras from my desktop. All of this is now done literally just from the click of a mouse. And uh, so this, this screenshot kind of behind the, the camera itself is a screenshot from this morning. Um, and I happened to catch it right at a time when the valley uh, pair and the uh, Weston pair were feeding, and then it wasn't but about 10 minutes later, the Oak Creek pair started feeding uh, their, their chicks in the box. So um, many of you may know Port Washington this year, uh, for some reason, the, the eggs did not, uh, did not um, hatch. It looks like the, something happened uh, while they were incubating um, the, the eggs when they were cracked open. Uh, unfortunately, the, there was very, very little, if any, development inside uh, the eggs, even up until about a week ago when the last one kind of um, broke. But it happens. Um, we've had an incredibly uh, successful run on successful nests. Uh, in all the years that we've been running this program, we've only had 11 nests in total, uh, be failed nests with, with uh, not producing young out of it. So. Um, when active anyway, like the, the Green Bay one here in the bottom left, that's not an active nest site, so we don't, we don't consider that in that, but um, of the dozens and dozens and dozens of clutches that have, have been raised and, and fledged from the nests, we've had just 11 not, not work out. And uh, part of that's nature. We, we don't know and probably never will know exactly what happened at Port Washington this year, but uh, it may have been that for one reason or another, the eggs um, didn't successfully get fertilized, and that, that does seem to look like what happened because there was, like I said, there was very little development in those eggs this year. Uh, the corporate website. <clears throat> if, um, if you haven't, I, I want to uh, pose a very strong encouragement to you to, to go onto our corporate website. Um, we combined the WPS and the We Energies website last year. Uh, so now you get the, the opportunity to view all, all five cameras uh, on the site. And then we have Greg's uh, nesting reports and the archive going back uh, nearly 20 years, uh, as well as some other informational and educational pieces within within the website. So a simple Google search for um, We Energies or WC Energy Group or WPS Peregrine Falcon camera, and it'll take you right to the site. Other opportunities, so uh, we are running our, our naming competition this year with COVID-19, we had to kind of adjust our plans for reaching out to some classrooms and other community groups. Um, it's an entirely online vote, and uh, it's it's an, a whole bunch of cute names um, that, that our media folks came up with to sort of honor um, the favorite things about Wisconsin. You can vote as many times as you want, as often as you want, and I think each time you vote, you can select five names, but it's uh, Squawk the Vote is the the tagline this year, and we've had other other opportunities for naming. Um, this, in fact, I believe was uh, a River Edge um, uh, um, 
winter at the at the farm to uh, table dinner in the fall. I was the granddaughter of the, the person that won that year. Uh, in the top right, I did want to mention. So, <laughs> unfortunately, a few years ago, and this this does happen from time to time, and nobody will ever will ever really ever understand why. But uh, we did have two falcons uh, shot um, in the middle of winter, is in February, January, February time frame, east of Miller Park. Um, so right in the middle of the city of Milwaukee. Um, one of them was, was found dead, one was found injured, and they ended up, the one that was injured, they ended up finding uh, or finding it in the back of a bar um, parking lot somewhere down that way. Uh, got it over to the uh, Humane Society, and then we sponsored uh, um, basically the recovery um, dollars that were needed for the Humane Society to, to uh, um, bring that falcon back to health. And then it was ultimately, it had a broken wing, um, didn't, they didn't expect that it would fly again, but it made a full recovery and they released it again. Uh, I think it was about two months later. So from that standpoint, there, uh, there are some unfortunate things that happen sometimes and, and, um, we, we try to be involved where we can. Banding participation, you know, we, we bring in different groups. We've had veterans groups, we've had Cub Scout groups, in addition to the school groups, we've had uh, WSO, we've had um, Natural Resource Board, we've had other local community groups um, attend some of our special bandings at, from time to time. All right, I am very long-winded today. I've got a few more slides about eagle and osprey management. Uh, just to, to kind of touch base on um, a few other things that we do. So the, the graphic here shows our eagle and osprey, the counties in which we do eagle and osprey um, management. Um, many of those in the far north parts of the region are related to our hydro um, electric facilities. And then the southeast and eastern part of the state, many of those are related to osprey platforms that we, we install across our WPS and we energy territories. So it's, it's largely the eastern half of Wisconsin and, and the western half of the UP. Here's a, a shot of some of the hydroelectric project uh, locations along the Wisconsin River in the middle, the Peshtigo River kind of um, to the right there, and then the Menominee River system to the north. We have a total of 30 hydroelectric projects, and um, with many of them we have hundreds, sometimes thousands of acres of land that uh, are home to eagles and ospreys and um, some with natural uh, natural nest sites and others with artificial nests that we install um, at those properties. Here's a shot of a juvenile eagle that, uh, that I was able to get really quite up close to. There was a, actually had a, a dead fish underneath that log that it was feeding on. Um, this is a, an old colleague of mine who's now retired, but uh, we were out doing some of our, our uh, biological survey work that we do every summer. We do occasionally have uh, pole to nest or, or pole and nest hazards. Um, this picture on the left shows a nest that uh, was a, a nest structure that was um, intentionally placed there to try to keep them up above the cross arms. It, it oftentimes, when when osprey or eagles nest on our poles, it oftentimes ends up resulting in uh, mortality. So we do make you know efforts to try to um, mitigate those circumstances. In this case here, you can see they installed some additional or um, extra long cross arms to get that nest out and away from the wires so that when the young uh, or adults for that matter were to land on the nest, they would not come in contact with the wires. And this is, this is an annual occurrence, in fact, and it's not just eagles and ospreys. Um, it, it's sometimes uh, related to um, Owls. In fact, we just we had a couple of incidents with owls here in the last few weeks um, that that we send out our troubleshooters and our, our linemen and uh, try to come up with a solution to um, minimize that mortality that can happen on the tops of these wires. Here's a shot. This is actually up in um, the Land of Lakes area, uh, north of Lake Vita's there. Um, that eagle <laughs> actually came in and perched as the line crew was up in the bucket basically moving the nest out on that extra long cross arm and the, the lineman actually got a shot of the eagle 
perched there watching him as he was doing it, almost a, out of curiosity, but maybe out of kind of a thanks. Hey, I appreciate what you're doing for us. Um, Osprey Nest Sites, uh, almost every year I get involved with at least a couple or three. Um, I can't always get to all of them, and, and sometimes the requests that come in don't always uh, don't have suitable locations to install the, the Nest platforms. But um, the types of things we're looking for is sort of open fields away from trees near water where they can they can do their hunting and, and catch their, their prey being the fish. Public and private lands both. Um, we've done a number of projects or, or nest platforms on DNR lands or county-owned lands, sometimes a municipal property, um, but oftentimes, too, we do it on private lands from owners uh, that have a, a particular interest and, and request um, us to come in and, and put up a, a nesting platform for them. Here's just a couple of shots of the actual pole installation so we get our, our uh, pole setting equipment out there. Uh, this one is a um, private pole setter, what they call private pole setter on tracks, so that it minimizes the, uh, the, the rutting that can happen in the, in the ground. Um, sometimes if it's frozen or if it's dry conditions, we'll, we'll do it with uh, bucket trucks. And here's just a few shots of some of the different types of habitats and, and scenes with the crews on where we, we were able to get in and install the, the platforms. So with that, I ran about 10 minutes longer than I thought I might talk. I apologize for that, but we do have a few minutes for some questions. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Mike. That was great. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen now, I'll I'll pull up the chat okay. and then we can see everyone. And we do have some questions that came in, so we'll start with those. And then if others okay. have questions, we can, of course, entertain those as well. We'll see if we can do as good as those um, the school kids that you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I do have to check something. I had a meeting scheduled for me this morning from my vice president at 11 o'clock. Okay, so we so, may just have a couple minutes with you. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. fine. Well, let's let's do a couple of these questions quick. Um, so, when is the start of the breeding season for the peregrine falcons? Great question. Um, in a normal year, when they start returning from uh, wherever they were during winter, um, or if they were local, they will often pair up and um, begin their courtship in the latter part of middle to latter part of March. And then eggs are typically laid um, right at the la last part of March and early April. Once they start courting, it doesn't typically take too long for the eggs to be laid. Great. Um, does age impact egg viability? So like the age of the breeding pair? Um, I, I would say that age impacts the adult's ability to defend their nest. Um, their nest site, I should say, not so much the eggs. So what comes first is having a viable and strong pair to be able to, to defend their nest location. And if they're successful in doing that, then they're able to hopefully lay eggs and, and uh, um, carry out a successful nest that season. Um, we've had an adult female, I believe she was 15, 15 or 16 years old when she finally didn't return the following season. So. Um, age does not seem to affect them so much from an egg laying standpoint or successful egg hatching. It's more to, has to do with their ability to defend a nest location. That makes sense. Awesome. Oh, and I think uh, this kind of pair, this goes really nice with that is do you, um, what is your recorded oldest, youngest and median age of breeding pairs? So what are we talking about with the sure. age? Yeah. So, so great question. The oldest, uh, like I said, was, I believe she was 16, um, was her last nesting year. Uh, the youngest, normally we don't see um, falcons start nesting until they're at least two or three years old. Uh, I would say the average is in the six to seven age range. Um, oftentimes when you get one to nest and, and if it's a, a strong uh, female and a strong pair between the female and the adult and the, and the male, uh, you will oftentimes get, oftentimes get multiple years, as many as 10 or 12 years. But the average, I would say, would be in that five to six-year-old range. 
Excellent. And actually, uh, Sharon's next question was exactly what was popping in my mind. So do they mate for life? Did you say that, Mike? Uh, as best as we know, yes. When they pair up, they mate for life. Um, oftentimes what happens is you'll get a, a stronger or more aggressive male that might come in and take over uh, the male, the resident male that was there, or vice, you know, it could be with the female as well. Um, when they take over a nest site, it's usually a territorial battle to the death. So um, if, if you are strong, if you're a falcon and you're strong enough to hang on to your nests and your pair, uh, pair bond, uh, you will be nesting with that pair for life. Unfortunately for some, life doesn't last as long as the other side of the pair. <laughs> so you can sometimes get the same, let's say it's the same female uh, who ends up um, mating with another male if the, if the new male the, came in and took over the resident male. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why you have those brooms, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions about preferred food. Um, and one specifically for the more urban falcons, I guess. Um, what's the preferred food and do you see a difference depending on the environment that they nest in? Sure. Um, so Greg had done a study, a prey, uh, a prey study a number of years ago, and he had documented that they will utilize um, many dozens of different species. There did seem to be a trend to being um, kind of a top 10, if you will. And near the top 10 is uh, pigeons. Pigeons are one of the, the favored foods, I guess, for peregrine. Um, songbirds, other songbirds, larger songbirds, as well as some of the smaller shorebirds, uh, like grebes and, and um, uh, rails and, and uh, even some, some very small ducks sometimes can be part of that prey source. But um, pigeons in an urban environment are often and I don't know if it's because pigeons are just common in an urban environment and that's what attracts peregrines or if peregrines actually uh, are seeking out the pigeons, but uh, pigeons are near the top of the list. Good old pigeons. Yeah. <laughs> like their Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yep. Thanksgiving in July. <laughs> so, so we should all feel good about fattening up the pigeons if we have them in our yard because they could be a great meal for a peregrine falcon. How about that? They could be. <laughs> it, it, um, you know, Jess, it, it, we've had a number of times where there are pigeoners, people who, you know, um, have oh. pigeons who are adamantly uh, just, they just hate peregrine falcons. They, there's an yeah. absolute hatred um, because the falcons are taking out the pigeons. So yeah. we have to deal with that from time to time. But Yeah, I guess that makes sense in a way. So I had, yeah. uh, you know, as much as, as I'm obviously an environmental educator, pro nature, all of that, the day I saw a um, red tailed hawk eating one of my chickens, like in the first uh -huh. couple of years that I raised chickens, I was not happy with that red tailed hawk. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no love there. <laughs> I, I can imagine, because you, you, yeah. you invest your time and money yeah. and effort into raising your chickens, yeah. and if something else is eating it, mm -hmm. there's an emotion yeah. there. Yeah, I, I ran towards them like that is Sally. You have to stop eating Sally, you know. So, anyways, <laughs> okay. One quick uh, last question, Mike, and we'll let you go for your meeting. Is um, what is the percentage? So, what's their survival survival rate of falcons like in the first year? So, when they hatch, what's that kind of survival chance? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so, it's over fifty percent of all falcons within the first year don't make it um so mm -hmm. right off right off the right off the top about 50 percent a little more than that uh, those that make it through the first year have a fairly high success uh, or survival rate um, but by the time they get to breeding age it's estimated to be somewhere around uh, only 30 to 35 40 percent of all falcons that fledged uh, are still remaining um, most of the time they're taking each other out is, oh. is uh, just from territorial battles um, is, is really the, what, what they succumb to is one falcon taking out another. Hmm. Wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So any <laughs> last questions? Yeah, thanks Mike. <laughs> 
they're aggressive little little guys, aren't they? They My are. Goodness. They are. <laughs> yeah. Um, but wonderful and an important part of our world for sure. Um, is there any last questions for Mike? Otherwise, we'll let him go to his meeting. Well, Mike, thank you so much. This is wonderful. And folks can uh, certainly go on and see those live cams and watch the Falcons that way. I know there's a whole bunch of other live cams around with eagles and things. Uh, so it's a wonderful, wonderful way to connect right now with our natural yeah. world. And um, yeah, so get on out there. Well, thanks, Mike. My pleasure, Jess. And uh, thank you for all of your time uh, for hearing me talk for a bit about our programs. And, and uh, if you have any questions after this, feel free. If, you, if you've got my contact, send them to me. Or, or if you want to go through Jess or Natalie, that's fine, too. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, we'll let you go. And I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. So yes, we'll okay. give Mike a virtual round of applause. We're, thank you so much. And before people right, leave, you. we'll turn it over to, thanks Mike, turn it over to Natalie to talk about next week on our Tea and Topics with River Edge. Yeah, next week um, we have Casey Tate up. So I'm just gonna let you speak cause you're on the call today. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, um, this is Casey. Come next week to learn all about the fossils that you can find around Wisconsin, um, some notable sites, how to start your own collection, um, how to identify some of the fossils that are in our area, and uh, learn your new favorite word, Lagerstatten. So if you want to learn more about that, <laughs> um, come next week. <laughs> I've been reading all of them <laughs> lately, so I just love saying that word. Um, and it's, they're really, really fascinating and cool. So hope you Thank can join. You, Casey. <laughs> That'll be awesome. And for anyone who hasn't had the chance to, uh, you know, witness Casey um, as an educator, she's incredibly engaging. So it'll be wonderful. Um, back next week. And then the week after that is our last currently scheduled teen topics. We um, may have some more coming up, but the last one currently scheduled is with Melissa Kieran from Stantec. She's an orchid biologist who is working with River Edge and lots of other partners across the country on an orchid restoration project. So that'll be the last week of May. Yep, that sounds wonderful. Um, so thanks everyone. It was great to see your faces. Always good to connect. I look forward to Wednesday morning every single week and learning something new and seeing all of you. So you have a wonderful day and enjoy the weather. Thank it's you. Funny. <laughs>